just have a nice low energy lecture. I was going to continue talking about carbohydrates and I realized it's March. And so really should move on a little bit. Might come back to some of that stuff later, but what's left is talk about some glycomimetics and things I get really excited about, but I don't know if anyone else does. And so it's not as relevant. Um, so the next portion of the course is really focusing on peptides, amino acids, proteins. Um, now th this, for the most part, people have a lot sounder background in amino acid biochemistry than sugars. Normally this is a much more comfortable space for people. So let's just start with a few definitions. So if I use the terms protein, peptide, amino acid, what what's your what's your working definition when you think about those words? Um, I think. Uh, a protein is the larger unit. I guess a peptide would be the subunit of a protein, and then amino acid would be the. I know these aren't definitions now that I'm saying them out loud, but <laughs> no. But I'm okay with this. But let's explore. I think this. I think that's a good way to start it. I. Th I think I. I think I agree with you completely. So okay. now let's sort of think about what subunit means of a protein. Like what, what do you mean when you said a peptide is a subunit of a protein? Um, I guess it's a section of the larger <laughs> entity. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, um, how would you divide it though? Like how would you go, okay, this is a peptide, that's a peptide. It's um, based on function uh, or structure. Okay, or... okay I'll, I'll take that. I like, I like that. So... A protein, I, I would consider this, it doesn't even need to be a long chain of amino acids, but it is a fully functional. Now, if you look, you'll find lots and lots of definitions up there. Uh, biomolecule. Don't think helps the definition consisting of peptides. Um, I'm, I'm kind of of the, so I think you can have, you can have proteins with multiple subunits, which are not one molecule. I tend to think of those subunits as individual proteins, which then come together to form a complex, which has the function. And so we might have an alpha chain, a beta chain to a protein, and independently, those two don't have function. When they come together as two chains, they're not covalently bound, they're just attached, they just kind of find each other and bind like soulmates in a cell. They give function. But I would argue that each of those subchains is a protein in and of itself because it's a complete thing that will give function when it assembles with other molecules. So I'm happy with sort of a fully functional biomolecule consisting of peptides. Um, it's fine if your definition then includes, you know, multiple components. Uh, that's fine. Normally this has three dimensional structure. structure that's been erased and normally I would say you know the a protein is normally involved as a enzyme 
receptor structural component. or activator. So normally it's it's um, it has there really are very few functions like biology is really simple if, if you try not to think about it very hard at all. Like either your protein turns thing A into thing B as an enzyme, your protein binds thing A, recruits something and does something, so it's a receptor. Your protein ties stuff together and links different pieces together. So you have um, structural components. This is things like um, capsids on viruses, or you can have actin or fibrin, or your protein is a very specific activator of another protein or of DNA transcription or something. And you know, it kind of has defined functions. So a peptide is a chain of amino acids. Happy with that definition? Normally, um, secondary but not tertiary structure. And I'm going to say normally because there are exceptions. So of course there are. So the word for peptide comes basically from digest, the word uh, Greek word for digestion, the idea that a peptide is the digestion product of a protein, like it's a subproduct of a protein. And the original idea was that peptides were like just, you know, waste, garbage. But of course, peptides do have a lot of biological function, but normally they act as ligands. And so you have lots and lots of really important peptides. Now, I, I took a quick look at my textbook and I took to see what it what it said. And it said that a peptide is 5 to 50 amino acids. And a protein is greater than 50 amino acids. And I think that's a shitty definition. Because I think you can have things that are essentially peptides. They don't have function. They're 73 amino acids long, but they're just like a chain of amino acids. That's not a protein. That's a peptide. And yet you can have, there's probably not a lot of proteins getting under 50 amino acids, but you can have something that is independently functional all on its own, carrying out enzymatic activity at relatively small sizes. Okay, so what's an amino acid? Um, uh, an amide, or sorry, an amine, or wait, yeah, an amine and then a carboxylic acid? Yeah, a molecule with an amine and a carboxylic acid. I forgot what an amine was for a second, sorry. <laughs> You're a synthetic chemist, right? Uh, sure. <laughs> So generally what we're talking about when we say amino acid and when, how even I work on things that don't, aren't like this and that that's my, my, what my, what I'm really interested in. But when we're thinking about amino acids, we're thinking about alpha amino acids. And so that's. Generally molecules of this form. And the reason they're called alpha amino acids is because the amine is at the alpha carbon to the carboxylic acid.
those are your canonical amino acids, um, like the like the twenty that make up our body are all alpha amino acids. Um, there are like there are other types of amino acids, like this is an amino acid. It is not a natural amino acid, and so you'll have people. I guess leave it out of that, but it is an amino acid. It's an amine and an acid, but it is not an alpha amino acid. And so generally we're going to be talking about alpha amino acids and generally we're going to be talking about alpha amino acids integrated into peptides. The reason we're not going to talk so much about proteins is because this isn't really a biology course and the chemistry kind of gets lost when the molecule gets, gets that big. And so what I really want to think about is how do you make these? So how do you make a protein? Like in the, in, in, in the la in reality, if it was like, okay, let's go make this protein. How would you make that protein? Like, like the regents and everything or? Yeah, generally, what would, what approach would you use? Uh, hydrolysis. You want to make a protein. Let's say we've got, you got amino acids. You got some cysteine, some methionine, you got your 20 amino acids. We're not going to list them. Like. If you need to pull up a table of amino acids, make sure you have you refamiliarize yourself with the amino acids. We're not going to recover them. So I, I think generally we can think chemically, biochemically, um, by isolation. Like I, let's say I want you to get some, I don't know, acetylcholinesterase enzyme breaks down esters and acetylcholine, hence its name. I think that's what it does. Like, would you want to make it, would you make it chemically? Would you make it using a different approach? Um, maybe with enzymes? Yeah. What I would do is like, I would code a plasmid, I would stick it into a bug and I would get the bacteria to make it for me. Right? Um, so, If all amino acids are natural, canonical, use E. coli. Like there's no, so I'm a chemist. I think like a chemist, but I'm not an idiot. And if you want to make a protein. Proteins are big. They're hard. We're going to spend some time in the next few lectures talking about ways to go about making a peptide. And it's convoluted and it's awkward and the yields suck. And you got to be careful. And the entire time that you're doing that and trying to figure that out, your body is happily making proteins on a constant basis, right? You're like, I was, um, I was making insulin in a lab in grad school for something. And I was having real trouble making insulin. And the entire time I was trying to make insulin, of course, my body was making insulin like absolutely no problem at all, just constantly pumping it out. So it's always better if you can to use biology. So when you want to make peptides chemically, or proteins chemically, normally what you want is why chemical? There's normally two reasons. One, short peptide. These are hard to isolate from biological mixtures. I'm just going to call it bug juice. 
Normally they're pretty polar. Uh, you're, you're, you can overexpress it. You can get a plasmid in there. You can massively overexpress it. You can make lots and lots of that peptide. But you're going to have a really great hard trouble separating that peptide from all the other stuff that's in that uh, bacteria or cell. So short peptides. are really 5 to 15 especially are really hard to isolate from bug juice the second thing is lots of peptide so normally you don't need that much protein to actually do whatever you're going to do with the protein like if you start looking at if you need to make an enzyme for something or isolate an enzyme or you need to isolate a protein to do some analyses on it or figure out how it interacts with something else or crystallize some you don't need very much and um, cells are pretty good at that but the problem of course is if you're trying to get a cell to make a lot of acetylcholinesterase for example um, it can you you can tell it okay make a lot more than normal that's fine but at a certain point you're going to start hurting the cell because that enzyme is going to start doing its thing or it's going to start um, binding to other proteins in the cell and inactivating them and so you eventually you kill off the cell once you're tighter or the protein gets too high. So some cell types are much more resistant to this. That's why we have these special production bacteria cell types. Um, some cell types are a lot less resistant to it and they die really easily, like basically all mammalian cells. So if you want to make a lot of protein, you need an awful lot of cells and cells are not necessarily easy to grow. Whereas if you have a peptide and you want to make like hundreds of milligrams or gram quantities of that, the amount of cells that you would need to use would just be insane. So it can be easier to synthesize it because you can make more, a little bit easier if you're making a lot of a peptide. Easier chemically. Uh, don't need a bioreactor the size A Vancouver Aquarium. Like, we're seeing this even that the, um, whenever you see all these new protein uh, biologics that are being made as drugs, they're really awesome. If you ever get if you ever get a chance to tour a pharmaceutical manufacturer that's making biologics, the size of the reactors that they're using are humongous compared to chemical reactors, but their yield is so much lower because cells need a lot more space to grow. So it's it's a real problem. Three can add unnatural stuff. And this is what I'm always thinking about. And I think this is where the biggest strength of chemical synthesis comes in. Because I think we might be able to solve those top two problems. This bottom one is really, really tricky. We'll talk a little bit about some people have done some stuff to actually try and make add unnatural amino acids into biosynthesis using protein, uh, using cells. But it's tricky and it needs to be reinvented every single time you want to do it with a new amino acid. So it's a pain in the ass, um, but it is possible to do. So this is why you would want to do chemically. So let's think about what that means, what a chemical synthesis of an amino acid is, or of a um, peptide is. So let's take two amino acids. What's your favorite amino acid, uh, Kirsten? Does it, does it matter if it's basic or acidic? No, I don't care. What's your favorite amino acid? Uh, tryptophan. You're weird. Yeah, good luck with that one. <laughs> okay, no, just, all, just do I'm alanine. Just how it's attached. <laughs> so you um, got me. But I actually really should know this off the top of my head, and it's embarrassing I don't. Like, it's, an, it's a benzimidazole. But I can never remember. There it is. Really? I've watched that stupid Harvard amino acid structure video so many times. So do you remember where they are then? What each of them is? Absolutely not. Yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> okay, there's tryptophan. What's your favorite amino acid, Paul? Uh, proline. Okay, you guys are both weird. It's all good. Proline's a useful one. No, no, they're they're very useful. <laughs> the fans are useful. Shut up, man. Have a proline like turns and stuff. Tryptophan is a pain in the ass. Like it always. Okay, so so let's say we have proline and tryptophan, and let's say so W and P, right? If you need to, if you need to pull up a table of amino acid stuffs, um, I, like I, I could provide one, but it's a Google search away, and you guys are all really smart, so that'd be just a waste of time. So we have proline and tryptophan. And let's say we want to make PW. Okay, so first of all, what does that notation mean? So PW, do I mean the amino group of P attached to the carboxylate of W, or do I mean the carboxylate of P attached to the amino of W? The left is the N terminus. Second one, yeah. Yeah, the left is the N terminus, right? Always read N to C. We're going to come back to why I really wish they had done it the other way. But it's N to C. That is how we write them. So, okay, so we want to make N to C. So one thing we can do is we can do a Fisher peptide bond formation. So again, I think I mentioned this day one of the class. ML Fisher basically did all bioorganic chemistry, left nothing for anyone else. So what you do is you take W plus P, you take acid, um, and you take not water. So he did an ethanol, I believe, because there were very few solvents commercially available, but you could always get schnapps. And you heat it. And you get WP and PW. Because we have a problem, right? Like we have two free amines. Oh, and you also get WW and PP. And you get about a one to one to one to one. You probably actually get a little bit less of the ditryptophan because tryptophan just hates everybody. But other than that, they're going to be pretty even. So mechanistically, this isn't all that complicated. Um, sorry. So if you take a amino acid, I'm just going to use glycine. You add acid. Hopefully you're all protonating the amine. That of course is completely freaking unreactive. But occasionally, this is an equilibrium. It's not, well, it's a really extreme equilibrium. It really lies towards the, the left. you can get a proton transfer and transfer it over to the carbonyl. And you end up getting a free amine. And so if you have that, you've got another free amine somewhere that just doesn't have to be protonated at this moment.
You can get this guy. Gosh, uh, this is really messy. You know, I'm going to just make my... I want to make the pen finer. Okay, I'm sure there's a way to do it, but I'll figure it out later. You probably have to like right click on it and it'll make it, I can just make it a little bit finer. Okay, so we get, um, we have this, this is possibly charged. All this, sorry, this is also under, everything's under equilibrium. You can then get another proton transfer. There's a lot of if, ands, or buts here. This relies on the fact that you have a low water concentration, though. And you can get your peptide bond formed. Now this is a stupid way to make a peptide bond. And you actually couldn't really think of a stupider way to make a peptide bond. But you've made your amide, which I'm going to highlight in blue, by doing the elimination of water. It's a condensation reaction. Uh, heat it up enough, you have a dry enough situation that you can drive off the water, you will, and you will get, um, you will make peptides. But we don't have any selectivity here, because again, we can get all those mixtures. So what we want to do is we want to protect those two sides. So let's say we want to make a PW. So what we want to do is we want to connect the carboxylic acid of proline with the amine of tryptophan. So we want the carboxylic acid, if we want the carboxylic acid of proline, what we can do is we can protect the amine. We want to make it non-nucleophilic, so Let's stick an acetate group on there. This is a stupid protecting group. We're gonna come back and talk a lot more about better ones. But let's start here, it's nice and simple. And on tryptophan, which I'm gonna test myself by trying to do it without the structure in front of me. Let's stick a methyl ether, methyl ester on there. I think I can remember it because it's not connected where I think it should be connected to that five membered ring. That, that three position is a weird place to have a connection. So what we've done now is we protected the acetate, uh, the nitrogen of one side and a carboxylic acid of the other. So we've removed the possibility of any homocoupling that can't connect with itself. And we've removed, removed the possibility of backwards coupling. And there's no way around this. But heating the crap out of this with acid still seems like a really bad idea. Still, the overall concept of what we did, I'm just going to pop back a page for a second. Or I'm going to minimize my entire window. The overall idea of what we did is really highlighted here. What we did is we made the OH of the acid into a good leaving group. And we did it by protonating it here, turning it into water. Um, and that, that was challenging. That was not maybe the easiest way to go about doing this.
But what we did is we turned that oxygen, that hydroxyl group into a good leaving group. So, Fisher's improved synthesis is we take your proline, take Paul's proline, and we treat this with, he wouldn't have used this reagent at the time, but it'll work fine. Thionyl chloride and a little bit of DMF. And I think, I think we've done this mechanism. I don't know why, but it seems to strike me as we've chlorinated something. Am I wrong? Uh, it was in the assignment. I think we might have done it. <laughs> so it's in the assignment. You've done it then, hopefully. Yeah. So the the midterm was exactly what I promised. It was questions from the assignment. Was that a surprise to anyone? I was kind of surprised that people didn't just have like their, their questions kind of set up and they would just sort of photocopy them, drop them in and done, and submit it. Yeah, I definitely should have done that. I was regretting not putting them on my computer. <laughs> yeah, because everyone's going yeah. to write them. But that's okay. You could have just photographed and sent it in. I would have accepted that. I was just behind, so I didn't get the chance to finish uh, assignment three. But that yeah. doesn't seem wise. Yeah, it wasn't. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, I... I... Yeah, I'm going to post the next two, the last two assignments. Um, I'll do them this weekend. They'll be posted so that you guys have lots of like a month to do them. Because uh, it was my own fault. It wasn't, well, again, it wasn't like all every course I teach, I have the same rule, uh, which is if you do better on the final, the, the midterm mark disappears. So um, the midterm mark just slides into as part of your final mark if you do better. Uh, the vice versa doesn't happen. Your final mark doesn't disappear if you do better on the midterm. But I'm not, I, you know, if you need that, that's fine. Um, the final is cumulative. But you should have already done the assignments for one and two, or one, two, and three. Okay, so thionyl chloride DMF does not give us that. It gives us the acid chloride. And so now if we treat that with the amine, now suddenly it's really clear. This is a really good leaving group. And so our amine can come in, it can attack. You know, we don't have to worry about using acid. We don't want to use strong base either because shit it'll just hydrolyze that we don't want any hydroxide or anything but this is a very very straightforward way to do it i'm not really showing conditions here because again this is a stupid way to do it and we're not going to ever do this um i don't know the last time anybody made an amino acid or a peptide using an acid chloride i'm sure it's been done by somebody recently but i don't know why And I get to practice drawing trip to fan, so thank you for that. No problem. It's just a weird favorite amino acid. Okay. I like it because when I was learning all of them, uh, it has a W. So I used to say tryptophan is wiggity wiggity whack. And <laughs> that's the only reason I like it. <laughs> I love that. I, I, I absolutely love that. That's amazing. I, I agree with you 100% too. It's, it's, it's a whacked out amino acid. It's a weird ass amino acid. Okay. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, I dropped the hydrogen off the amide. I, I will always do that. I'll try not to. But that works okay. The problem, of course, is um, what we have to do here is we need to take our carboxylic acid. We need to mix it with like DMF and thionyl chloride. There's going to be HCl floating around. So we need to remove the thionyl chloride. So we need to isolate the acid chloride, but acid chlorides are unstable. They start decomposing as soon as you look at them. 
they need to stay stable long, but so, but you need to pull it out, then you need to put this thing into a new mixture. It's kind of a pain in the fucking ass. So ideally what we want is all one pot. So you just throw everything together. Mild. Fast. Easy. Stupid high yielding. So that's generally what we want when we're doing peptide synthesis is all of those things. The reason for the last one, like you always want high yields, like who doesn't want a reaction that isn't high yields. The reason for the last one though, is that let's consider, let's consider you're making an amino acid with 10 amino acids on it, or a peptide with 10 amino acids. Okay, so what's the minimum number of reactions we need to do to make 10 amino acids? Let's just change it to 11. If we're doing it in one after the other. So there is actually ways to do it in less, but let's... It's not really a trick question. So 10 coupling reactions. And 10 deprotection reactions. We're going to get into that in a second. But you would need to, because what you're going to get after the coupling is you're going to get a dipeptide, two residues, protected at both the C-terminus and the N-terminus. You'll need to uncap one of those to liberate a C-terminus or an N-terminus so it can attack to the next amino acid. So minimum number of reactions is 20 reactions. Okay. So if your yield is 100% for every single reaction, then your yield is 100%. So extremely high yielding is really good. Yield a total 11 AA. So if your yield is 99% for every single, you know, let's say your yield, actually let's go a lot lower. Let's say your yield is 75% for each reaction. Ballpark, what do you think the yield? And we're really bad at this. Like, I just punched it in my calculator. What do you think the yield is for the overall synthesis of the peptide? I, I don't know if you want to punch into your calculator, you can, but if you want to think about that for a quick second. Uh, it would be exponentially worse, right? Yeah. Yeah. So 75% is not a bad yield. You know, I guess soon come to me saying I got 75% yield on this. Um, I go, okay, good enough. Let's go. Fine. Um, when you put it in this term, that's shit. So even like a 90% yield, 
you know, it's got the Magic 9 in front. I think that's good. I should know. I knew this one off the top of my head. I don't know why. It's 12%. And then, you do something really good, like a 99% yield. It's still only 82%. So 99% is probably a little bit much to ask for. But 90% is unacceptably low. So what we need is we need really, really high yielding processes. But we also want them really easy to do. So unlike basically everything else in chemistry, we've actually got some solutions which actually do this, which is amazing. So I'm going to talk about two main coupling agents. There are lots out there. I think I have a few more lists in the assignment. Um, but the ones I'm going to talk about are the carbodiamides. and the uraniums. Uh, I'm gonna come back to the uranium. So we'll start with the carbodiamides. So what the fuck is a carbodiamide? It is a carbon which has two imides on it. That's a carbodiamide. Now R can vary. Um, the There are three that are really common. Um, we have R equals cyclohexyl. This is called DCC, dicyclohexyl carbodiamide. We have R equal ethyl. And then an actual kind of, I need to, I always forget what exactly the structure is because it's kind of weird. Um, so I'm actually going to draw it out. And it is an abbreviation for something else. Well, being a chemist, is everyone else thinks that other things are more important than chemistry. Ethyl and... You know what? I'm actually just going to draw it out. There's no easy way to do this. And I am I, I actually I should probably actually look up why they settle on this structure. So we have this is called EDC. Um the ethyl part gets it. It's ethyl three, three dimethyl amino propyl. But that's stupid. I'm just gonna call it EDC. I never I can never remember a name this damn thing. I also can never remember how long this chain is. The important part about this chain is that it puts this nitrogen a certain distance away from all of this, but it's not too big. So the molecule is not too big because that would be awkward. And ethyl is just the smallest thing they could think of. I think that worked well. I think methyl, you got some steric issues because it was just too reactive. This one, uh, we're going to come back to why EDC is so special. And then there's DIC, which I just... find funny. I like to think that was on purpose. Years old. Um, and that's R equals isopropyl. So mechanistically, these all work identically. Um, DIC actually is the most reactive. And when you think about an isopropyl and a cyclohexyl, they're actually really, really similar. Like a cyclohexyl is just, you, you added the rest of the ring, but it's really just an isopropyl uh, with more stuff on it. Um, so they react very similarly, but the cyclohexyl is bigger, so it's more sterically hindered. So DIC is more reactive. So it works really, really well. It's also a liquid, whereas the other ones are solids. And so sometimes a liquid is easier to work with than a solid. But like 
you know, we're splitting hairs here. Um, the magic thing about EDC is it's really easy to remove afterwards, and that's because of that nitrogen. And so we're going to come back to why that's really handy. Okay. So overall, we have these carbodiamides, and I said this is really going to give us this high-yielding, easy reaction. So what happens? Okay, well, what we do is we take your proline and tryptophan. I'm going to leave these protected the way I had them. Plus your tryptophan. And I just kind of blanked on what tryptophan is. I actually blanked on what an amino acid was, so I'm going to join Paul there. That makes me feel better. Yeah, it's okay. We don't need to remember what amino acids are. We can look them up. That, that's the value of being a senior student instead of being a, uh, a first year who has to memorize tables of amino acids. I, yeah, I just don't see a point. So you mix those together. Um, let's say we're going to use Dick. We need lots of Dick. Diethylpropylethylamine. Uh, that's okay. If I use DIPA. Do you both know what I mean? Is that a uh, Hunix base? Yeah, it's Hunix base. So just in case. Yeah, I think I remember it. For posterity. It's that. Diisopropyl ethylamine. It is the bulkiest triceps um, tertiary amine you can get. So it's not going to be a nucleophile. It's purely in there to grab extra protons. Uh, not as good as ETMB, as the assignment I was talking about, but a whole lot cheaper because you can buy that. The ETMB, you buy in little tiny little box balls and it's expensive. This you buy in like, I think we have a 20 liter drum somewhere. It's um, relatively inexpensive as a liquid. So you mix these things together. Normally this is can be done open to the atmosphere. Which is completely different from anything we saw with the carbohydrate chemistry, which was all like, get the water out of here because the water is competing as a nucleophile. Water, water doesn't compete as a nucleophile, which is the other reason we don't like using things like the acid chlorides, because the acid chloride is such a good electrophile that you can hydrolyze that to the carboxylic acid and you lose everything. What we want is we want something that's going to make a good leaving group but not such a good leaving group that water can displace it. We want to make it such that you need to use an amine to displace it, which is a better nucleophile than water. Um, some of these reactions you can actually run in water. People have actually done full peptide syntheses in water, which is the exact opposite of what we would have thought of with that Fisher peptide synthesis at the beginning. And it just tells you about how far we've come in designing these kinds of things. And this is going to give us our um, N-terminus, I, PW. Okay. So mechanistically, we're just going to reduce these down just like we have reduced the, um, the carbodiamide down to its core, we're just going to reduce these guys down to their core. So all we're going to do is we're going to talk about just the amine and a carboxylic acid. So you have an amine, you have a carboxylic acid, you have a tertiary amine base. Normally, the amounts here, you'd have 1.0, 1 1.0, 1 1.0, 2.5. The molar equivalents. You can play around with that a little bit. You can switch, depending if one of those um, amino acids are particularly valuable, you can use it as a limiting agent. But in this case, 
they're equally readily available, let's say. So that, and we've got the carbodiamid. So whenever you're doing chemistry, mechanistically, and everything's neutral, I always think the first thing we should try and do is make something charged because then chemistry can happen more easily. So do we have any candidates for making something charged? Can you deprotonate something with the base? Yeah, what are you gonna deprotonate? The carboxylic acid. I like that. So now what we have in our mixture plus the other things. And so in this case, now we're going to bring the dick into play. So the base is going to do the deprotonation, but this guy is actually pretty basic too. So we can get this proton exchange. If we do that, I'm not going to redraw. I'm just going to erase. We'll get that. So any thoughts on what might not happen next? Does the oxygen attack that positive nitrogen on deck? Yes, you're not quite right. Um, it's going to attack the deck, but it's not going to attack because the nitrogen there already is making four bonds. Okay, so it would attack the other nitrogen then, right? Or the carbon? Or the carbon, and then... exactly. So if we do that, we end up with that. Okay, so now what I want you guys to think about for a second is what do you know about urea? super stable urea is um urea is really really unreactive you almost can't get it to do anything and it looks like it should be reactive because you've got that poor carbon in the middle there is making four bonds of heteroatoms and most of the time when it's not carbon dioxide you're talking about carbonates or carbonates or something and they're, they're pretty reactive molecules but urea is not at all reactive so what our driving force is with these carbodiamides is we're trying to make ureas. And so whenever you're trying to do something stupid, we saw how hard this was uh, in the first, at the beginning of the lecture, we were talking about, okay, you need to heat the crap out of this with water and acid and you generate some water and you make the peptide bond. 
that's not easy. So where are you, and here now we're doing this at room temperature, we've got mild reagents. So where, where are we paying the price? And we're paying a price by making a really, really strong urea. And so we can get this chemistry to work by coupling difficult chemistry, hard to do chemistry, which is basically getting rid of an oxygen, uh, by coupling with really, really favorable chemistry, which is making your urea. And like a lot of chemistry works that way, you couple an unfavorable step with a very favorable step. Like really in the end, that's what reagents are, is unstable things that want to become something more stable and so they do the chemistry you want them to do. So we have this activated thing. So what I'm going to call just, besides this being like, you know, activated dick, this is an active, activated ester is the term we're going to use. And what that means is that it's prone. It's no longer like a normal ester. Yeah, you can break that ester bond. You can have a leaving an alcohol leaving group. It's okay, but it would be really nice if we can get something a whole lot better than an alcohol leaving group. And activated esters have things which are much much better leaving groups. So here, what we have is we're basically begging this thing to release urea, and so. Can put it out of its misery and do that. By bringing in our mean. So what I want you to think about here is the position between this nitrogen and this carbonyl. So that's a one, two, three, four atoms. And nature's magic number is six. So if we have an amine coming in, we can redraw that slightly. So I'm going to do that on the next slide. But if you beat me to it, that's better. So what you can have here is you can kind of have a six-membered ring where this nitrogen starts making a bond to that hydrogen. This nitrogen starts making a bond to that carbon. And so as this transitions, We turn some dick into du, which is diisopropyl urea, and so and we've made our peptide. So what we've done is we've coupled that really unfavorable peptide bond, like losing the oxygen, which is hard to do, with a really really favorable making the urea. DCC follows the exact same mechanism; it's just you replace the cyclo the isopropyls with cyclohexyls. EDC follows exactly the same mechanism, except you replace it with the asymmetric thing. <clears throat> the difference comes between these things at this stage, because both of those guys there are organic soluble. Because remember, your amino acid is protected on both sides. That's, that's going to be like soluble in DCM, ether, and all that stuff. So is the diisopropyl urea. And one of the really, really irritating things about these ureas is they they stick to your molecules 
and you try and purify the damn thing and you get urea in it and you can't get rid of the ureas. Um, there are some tricks that work a little bit better for that, but they're a pain in the ass. Where EDC comes into its own is suddenly if you treat that with an acid wash, just going back to EDC, if you treat the, when, when you've done all this, EDC is going to become EDU. You know what? It'll be really confusing if I draw it on this slide, so I'm going to draw it where we have it here. You can protonate that nitrogen really easily with like 10% HCl. Suddenly that goes into your aqueous phase and you clean up everything. And so EDC is really, really good when you have really, really polar, uh, non-polar amino acids. Um, it doesn't tend to couple as well as DIC, but because it's so easy to clean up, it works better. All these acronyms are so much more useful if we had to memorize this stuff, because we could say that EDC cleans up better than DIC, but we don't need to. Okay. So that's the carbodiamides. That's really all there is to them. The other ones I want to talk about are the uraniums. And so... What are these? Well, they're weird. Again, I have, um, so they were initially invented as bombs, but they didn't work very well. And so they turned them into peptide coupling agents. Anytime you see this many nitrogens on something, somebody tried to turn it into an explosive. So you take a benzyl triazole and you attach it to basically this guanidine kind of thing that's sticking out of there. And this one I'm drawn here, it's called HBTU. I'm not even gonna try and remember what that stands for. There's a series of these, well, there's three really. There's a lot of other peptide coupling agents. I'm, I'm not gonna talk about them, but they're mostly just derivatives of these guys. This is HCTU. The C stands for chlorine. The B here stands for benzotriazole. Um, the other one also has a benzotriazole, but the C stands for chlorine. And because we had a B and a C, somebody went, you know what we really need is an A. You know, they could have, I don't know, P would have worked better for like puridine or something, but they're using A for Aza. This is H-A-T-U. Or Hatu. Hatu, Hectu, H-B-T-U. Because you can't pronounce that any other way. So this is the most reactive. Second third. You don't see um, HBT is still the cheapest, which is good. But it's hard to argue to use the cheapest reagent when everything else is so freaking expensive in your synthesis. Might as well just use something a little bit better. Um, 
of course, you're always balancing most reactive versus I don't want it to be that reactive because then you get lots of side reactions if it's too reactive. So HCTU tends to get used for most of these things and HATU a little bit less. But it's kind of hidden. But this is also driven by urea chemistry. So again, if we take our amine, our carboxylic acid, DIPEA, HBTU, generally DMF is the reagent for, of choice for these ones. These are much more polar, so they don't tend to work as well on dichloromethane. Um, there are other uh, solvents you can use that doesn't really matter. Again, open to atmosphere. Now I'm paranoid, so I always do these things under nitrogen because I just don't believe that anything should be open to the atmosphere because the atmosphere is like dirty, full of oxygen and shit. Um, but it can be. And people have actually used HCTU in water and it works fine. You can use water as a solvent open to the atmosphere and it does the couplings. So it's, it's pretty specific. It's going to react with the means, but not with alcohols. And this is going to make our peptide bond. So how does this work? Well, First thing that happens actually is this guy rearranges. In solution, it's perfectly stable when it's not in solution. I've done something. What did I do wrong? Because that should be positively charged. I think these are normally, sorry, these are normally the PF6 salts. That's what I left off. Why PF6? Because uh, it's really, really soluble and is completely non-nucleophilic. If you had a chloride salt, the chlorine could be a nucleophile, could be a pain in the ass. Um, but PF6, BF4 salts are really, really soluble. I don't know why this is PF6 instead of BF4. I'm sure there's a good reason for that. But I, I, I don't know what it is. Sure, somebody has tried to do. Maybe it's because these are more crystalline. PF six to make nice crystals. BF four is going to be a little bit more liquidy, but still, I, I, I don't know. But that explains why my charges were all fucked up. Okay, so what we're going to do is basically another molecule of this. Is going to attack at that an oxide, which looks like it's kind of like a nucleophilic oxygen, with the only problem being that it's next to a positively charged nitrogen. The electrons will bounce out onto that, uh, that other nitrogen first. It's just I didn't show that. And then you will have
So this molecule up here is called HOBT. Um, the HO is OH, although it's almost always O minus. And it acts as basically a catalyst to make this thing on the bottom, which is your activated molecule. Because this is stupid reactive, because that bond is pretty damn weak. That new oxygen carbon bond. It, want, it looks like it wants to make a urea, and you're like, well, that's a pretty good bond. It wants to make a urea, but it can't because we can't really cleave that O-N bond. So now you have your carboxylate that you made of the amino acid by mixing your, carb, your DIPEA. Plus carboxylic acid. Goes to carboxylate. And now this attacks that guy up there. Okay, so this should be this now. These look nothing like the carbodiamonds until they look exactly like the carbodiamonds. Because now, if we take a look at what we've just made, we've made that. And so let's just sit for a second here. The difference between this and the carbodiamonds is the carbodiamonds only had a single alkyl group on the nitrogen, and they had a proton. Now we switch to two alkyl groups. So suddenly we don't have this thing where, you know, protons can come on and off hetero atoms. So there's kind of a little bit of flexibility there. This guy, that positive charge can't be reversed. You can't deprotonate it and suddenly make it go away and stabilize it. So this is more active than a carbonyamide. So what this leaves us with then is we've got a really, really good leaving group. We have an activated ester and it's more active than what we saw with the carbon diamonds. And so we make our product. Now you get the same product. This is tetramethylurea, TMU. Um, the ureas we get from DCC and DIC are irritating enough. This one is a pain in the ass. You can never really get rid of it. Nice thing is it's a single peak on the NMR, so you can comfortably ignore it and just don't pay too much attention to it. But it is, um, it's gonna, it contaminates everything. It's awful. So that is a drawback of these guys is you have this tetramethylurea. I would say that 99.5% of all peptide couplings are done with the six reagents that we talked about in class today. There are a bunch more which are used for really specialty cases. Uh, we're going to come back and we're going to talk a little bit about HATU and what's special about that. And I might touch on one or two of the other ones uh, at some point a little bit later in the course. But mechanistically, these six dominate the field. Uh, practically, they dominate the field. And so I think that they're the important ones to talk about. So next class, we're going to start talking about um, a 
Well, it's going to be about solid phase peptide synthesis. So we're going to start talking about how, what that is, why you would ever want to do it. Um, the strategies for that, what we need to be a little bit concerned about. So we're going to talk about that. We're going to go through some solid phase peptide synthesis, cover that, because I think it's really, really important that everyone knows a little bit about that. Then we're going to talk a little bit about how uh, differential protection on side chain amino acids and why you want to do that. We'll talk a bit about disulfide formation uh, and how you can control it. And we will talk about peptide cyclization and then some of the how you take two short peptides and make them into one long peptide. And there's a couple of really good ways to do that. So if you have a peptide that's too long to make on that easily, then you can take two of them and couple them together. But I think we'll cover all that starting, starting tomorrow or Thursday or whatever day it is of the week. So it's 521. I think we're done. I want to thank two of you for showing up because then I'm not lecturing to an empty room. So thank you.